And we pray, O oh Lord, that as we come to your word, that you would apply your word to our lives. That you would show us how desperately we need Christ. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would feed us. We pray that we would hear the shepherd's voice and that he would apply the balm of your word to every wound and to every need that we have. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would use this not only to strengthen us and to encourage us, but also that Christ may be glorified. O oh God, use your word to accomplish your purposes in our lives. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to John chapter 17. John chapter 17, we'll be uh, having our 13th lesson in the 17th chapter of John. Uh, Christina asked me before service, how many sermons do you think there are going to be in John chapter 17? And I think the answer is somewhere around 17. Yeah, I was going to let you hold your breath there for a second. 17 probably. Um, we'll see. But this has been a rich, rich chapter. As I said from the outset as we began studying this chapter, this chapter is perhaps the top of the, of the top, the cream of the crop in terms of chapters in Scripture. There are very few chapters in Scripture which compare with this one in terms of the content and the, the number of doctrines that are touched on throughout. So today we'll be looking at John chapter 17, verses 18 and 19. You've probably noticed um, over the past couple of years, there has been something of an exodus here in Washington state, uh, as our governor has continued to be the only governor left in the country who has refused to relinquish his emergency powers that he claimed in 2020, and as progressivism has become more and more hostile uh, and totalitarian in nature, uh, many who just want to have a nice life and don't want to be told what to do on the smallest and most remote things, uh, they've just decided to leave the state. Uh, so it's been something of an exodus. I mean, I personally know a few people who have moved to the Midwest or, or moved to Florida. You probably know some people personally as well who have exited the state over the past couple of years. But this isn't something that's only happened here in Washington state. It's been a phenomenon that California has experienced as well. In fact, it became such an issue for California. So many people and so many businesses were leaving that their governor actually got on TV and started begging people to stop leaving at one point. So many corporations joined the California exodus. San Jose dropped from fifth place to 22nd place over the span of a year in the rankings for cities that are the best business hubs, uh, while San Francisco plummeted from first place all the way down to 24th place. So it's hard to blame anyone. It's hard to blame any corporations or CEOs who are in charge of making decisions for corporations for wanting to leave states in which criminals aren't prosecuted, in which taxes get increased every year, and totalitarian governors somehow keep pulling out victories that allow them to remain in office, all while the housing market becomes more and more unaffordable for most people, making it at least very difficult for top companies to bring in top talent to work for them. Uh, our corner of the country has, meanwhile, grown in absolute godlessness especially over the past two years. I tell people that there isn't a country in the world that needs missionaries more than this area of the country does. And I don't say that tongue in cheek. But I'm not here to talk to you about politics and all that type of stuff. I'm here to talk to you about the Lord today. As Christians, we're also tempted to do what we've seen people do over the past couple years. We're tempted to have an exodus. We're tempted to at least retreat from the culture around us. It would be so much easier. It would save us from so much heartache. It would save us from so much 
humiliation maybe, wouldn't it, if we just withdrew from the culture as much as possible? Think of all the stress. Think of all the anxiety that we could avoid if we just lived in a place where everybody's a little bit more like us than they are down in that place. It's human nature to desire to surround ourselves by people who are at least somewhat similar to us in terms of their values and their practices. To be a Christian in a place like this, in a place like where we live, and I mean to really be a Christian, to really put your faith into action, to really live out your faith rather than just trying to blend in with everyone else. It requires that we be somewhat comfortable feeling like a fish out of water. Last week we had a visitor here from West Virginia, and he and I had a a long conversation after the service, and one of the things that I told him was that I'm so thankful that when I was growing up in Las Vegas, I was really into punk music, and I was really into the punk scene. I said, I'm not thankful for it because of how sinful the music is and, and the movement is, but because it taught me to be very comfortable being a complete nonconformist. I never felt like I needed to fit in with the people around me, and that has served me very well in ministry uh, because I don't think, honestly, I don't think that there has ever been a time in our country when Christians needed to be nonconformists as much as they do right now and comfortable being nonconformists as much as they do right now, especially in the corner of the country, the, at least the, the, the side of the country that we're in. As Christians, friends, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We're not to be conformed to the world or to the culture around us. That's what Paul says in Romans 12 too. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, if you have struggled over the past couple of years with a desire to retreat, as many people have, understandably to an extent, over the past couple of years, please let me give you just one small piece of advice. Consider why you are here right now. And I don't mean here in church, although, yeah, consider that, but consider why you are here in this part of the country right now. What does Scripture say about that? Remember, what we saw last week is that we want to apply Scripture to every part of our lives because Scripture is truth. So what does Scripture say about that, about us living right here, right now? It says, He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined the appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation that they would seek God. That's from Paul's sermon on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, uh, verses 26 and 27. What that means, family, is that you're here, you're living in this area because God ordained that you would live in this area. And you're here now because God ordained from eternity past that you would live right here, right now. You're living at this point in history because God ordained it so that you would see everything that's going around, uh, going on around you. Why did God put you here right now? First, that you would seek God, which I trust you have, especially if you're here today. But secondly, you're here in order that through your testimony, through your sharing of the gospel, through your lives, through your spoken words, that you would serve as a means of people coming to know And believe in, in a saving sense, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the central point of the text that we come to today in John chapter 17, verses 18 and 19. We've been studying Jesus' high priestly prayer throughout this chapter. And over the past few passages, uh, we've seen that Jesus prayed that the disciples, and, and we by extension, would individually, that we would personally exhibit several characteristics. He prayed that that the disciples and, and we would be characterized first by having experienced Christ's joy, secondly by having holiness, third by being a people who are uh, who love the truth, who are sanctified in the truth, who love and live by the truth of the scriptures. These are all things 
that we will have in fullness one day. Amen? When we're in glory, we're going to have all those things, and, and there's not going to be any kind of inclination to, to have less than the fullness of those things one day. And what a glorious day that will be. We look forward to that day. But until then, we're still to be striving for these things. We're to be characterized by growing in these things here and now, right where we are today. And we are to demonstrate all of those things before the world as we carry out our God-given mission in the world. Indeed, at least part of the reason that we're to have joy and holiness and a love for the truth is so that the world around us can see that we aren't like them. If we retreat entirely from the world, who's going to see it? And how will they see it? Who will tell them about Christ? Who will shine light in the darkness if we retreat from the culture? We are here in the world, but not of it, for the purpose of demonstrating these qualities as we infuse the gospel into the world, but without being infused by worldliness ourselves. And so Jesus prays this as we come to our passage today in verses 18 and 19. Jesus prays, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. Pretty straightforward. But that's not the end of the sermon. The words are simple. It's not difficult for us to understand exactly what Jesus is saying here, but they are difficult to apply to our lives if we're being honest. But it starts with this. It starts with understanding that Christ was sent. By whom? By the Father. Now, now, this is something that we've seen over and over again throughout John's gospel testimony. In John chapter 3, verse 34, Jesus, referring to himself, said, He whom God has sent speaks the words of God. In chapter 4, verse 34, he said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me. In chapter 5, verse 23, he said, He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So Jesus was sent, and Jesus has attested to this. Paul wrote of this as well. He said to the Galatians, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. That's from Galatians 4.4. 4. So Christ was sent. He was commissioned by the Father. From where? From heaven, where he dwells in eternity. To go where? To take on flesh. And to come into the world. He was, you might say, on a mission sent from heaven. We refer to this as the incarnation of Christ. That's probably the most common way to, uh, to refer to it. But it's also referred to as the condescension of Christ. Or you might even call it the humiliation of Christ. Uh, these phrases are a little bit more descriptive than the phrase, uh, you know, the incarnation of Christ, because they remind us that Christ temporarily took on this lower status by taking on flesh. That's why we call it the condescension of Christ. We call it the humiliation of Christ because he would be hated, he would be scorned, he would be rejected and despised by the world. He would even be crucified as the king of all creation. That's a humiliation. But he accepted the mission nevertheless. He was sent by the Father from heaven into the world, and he came willfully. Parallel to Christ's mission, then, we must see, is our mission. As you sent me into the world, in other words, in the same way that you sent me, just like you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. Do you see how these two clauses are parallel to one another? Same words, just different objects. Now, the purposes are different. The purposes for which Christ and his people are sent obviously differs. The purpose of Christ uh, taking on flesh and coming into the world was that he may live a sinless life, a perfectly sinless life, and be the only one who has ever done that. 
in order that He may offer Himself as a propitiation, as an atonement for sin on behalf of all who believe in Him. And our purpose is completely different. We are to sacrifice our lives in a sense, but not in the way that Christ did, not for the purpose that Christ did. Our purpose is to sacrifice our lives in the sense that we go and we live for the mission that Christ has given us. We go and we tell the world that there is no name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus only. Jesus is the means of salvation and the only means. So the characteristic that we're talking about here, the thing that should characterize the church as it relates to the disciples and and to us is mission. Mission. We should be characterized by joy, holiness, truth, and mission. This is why Christ left us in the world. He, He went to the Father. He didn't take the disciples with him. Why? Because he sent them into the world. Because there is a mission to fulfill. Christ left the disciples and the church on earth because he not only ordained who would be saved, but he also ordained how they would be saved. And how would people be saved? By his people preaching the good news of salvation in Christ. He has not only ordained the ends, but he has also ordained the means to the ends that he has ordained. And the way his people throughout the church age would be saved is by the preaching, the sharing, the proclamation of the gospel. Now, what some Christians try to do is they'll say, well, you know, Francis of Assisi said, uh, preach the gospel at all times, use words if necessary. So I'll just try to let my life speak for itself which is one of the, the dumbest quotes of all time, to be honest. Your life might look, and it should look, very different from the world. And, and so that should speak to the world in one sense. But there's also no action that you can perform that communicates the idea that one must repent of their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, aside from using words. Now, that can be spoken words, Uh, It can be written words in in a book, uh, for example, or for for maybe people who can't hear, you know, using sign language, uh, you know, it's it's specifically giving a message. It's not just some vague, ambiguous action that you do and somebody's like, oh, so so God sent his only son so so that all who believe in him, there's no action that communicates that. Words communicate that. Words have to be used. The idea, you may have heard me say this before, but the idea that we can preach the gospel with our lives uh, and, and therefore be, be faithful to our, uh, our God-given mission is as ridiculous as asking somebody, hey, give me your phone number, but don't use numbers. Can't be done. There is specific information that people need to have communicated to them. Each of us needs to know that if we are Christians, We are also missionaries. Let me say that again. If you are a Christian, you are also a missionary. And there are no exceptions. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how rich you are or how poor you are. It doesn't matter. If you are a Christian, you are a missionary. Because you have been sent by Christ. Every Christian is a missionary because every Christian has been sent into the world. You see what Jesus said? As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. Now, some would say, well, that's only referring to the disciples. Okay, let's go to Matthew chapter 28 then. The Great Commission is for everybody. Are you a Christian? If you're a Christian, you are a missionary. And the sooner you start to see yourself this way, the better. See, see, here's what the flesh would, would have us do. Here's what the flesh inclines us to do. The flesh inclines us to think that our purpose in life is to be comfortable and to have a good life. And for the person who isn't a Christian, by all means, uh, be comfortable, have a good life, because this sin-filled world is the closest thing that the pagan, that the unregenerate will will ever come to experiencing heaven if they continue to refuse to yield their lives in faith 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what we expect from the world, right? That's all they have to live for. So, okay, if you're, if you're unregenerate, you're not a missionary, so go ahead, move to a place where you'll be happy and comfortable and have a good life by all means. But if you're a Christian, you are a missionary, and your purpose is not, first and foremost, to be comfortable and to have a good life. Your purpose isn't to serve yourself. It's to serve Christ and to be faithful to the mission that he has given to the church. Now, let's be really sure that we're very clear about this. Christ has given us a mission, has he not? Christ himself has sent you, hasn't he? And where or to whom has he sent you? To the world. And this is where it becomes difficult to apply this passage to our lives, even though it's not at all difficult to understand what Jesus says. Because what we're talking about here is going to a people who hate Jesus and have done nothing throughout their entire lives from the second that they were conceived except despise and rebel against Christ their entire lives. That's who the world is in this context. Now, we know that there are several definitions for the Greek word that gets translated world. Uh, in fact, there are 10 different definitions, so we need to look at the context every time to determine which definition is applying here. You need to know, I need you to be clear on this, that this word doesn't refer to going into the world as in going to the countryside and withdrawing you know, away from human civilization. Now, sometimes the word can mean that. It can mean going out into the earth, but that's not what it means here because Christ wasn't sent into the countryside. He was sent into the world. He was sent into hostile territory among sinners. Your mission is life. Your mission in life is not to go to a peaceful part of the earth. It just means that before any other vocation, before any other calling that you have, you are a missionary to the unregenerate, to the lost. It was Charles Spurgeon who famously said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter, end quote. And he'd go on to add that, quote, that man who says, I believe in Jesus, but does not think enough of Jesus ever to tell another about him by mouth or pen or tract is an imposter, end quote. Now, this doesn't have to be difficult. Sharing the gospel doesn't have to be difficult. We tend to make it difficult. We tend to overcomplicate things. But if you think about it, we naturally talk to people. We naturally want to tell people that we know about the things that we love and the things that we like, don't we? I mean, that's why uh, we have apps where we can leave reviews for a business. Uh, it's why search engines have a place for consumers to leave reviews for businesses that they've patronized. It's why when you buy something on an enormous e-commerce website, you might scroll through all the reviews first just to see what people's experiences with that thing were. And the the reason that they leave those reviews is because people naturally like to talk about their experiences, things that they like or things that they dislike. So why would it be any different with Jesus? Yeah. Why would it be any different with the gospel? If Christ is my greatest love, as he should be, and say I, I've got a friend who, who wants nothing to do with me because he can't stand Jesus. Well, now I'm in a situation where I have to pick and choose. And I have to go with Jesus. Obedience to Christ would compel me to urge that friend to reconsider their hatred of Jesus and to evaluate their spiritual status in light of what Scripture says. What are you going to do when you stand before God someday, friend? What are you going to do when he judges you for everything that you have done in your entire life, reconsider, please. As Paul would say to the Corinthians, the love of Christ controls us. That's from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Now that can also be translated as the love of Christ constrains us or compels us. When he says that, is Paul saying that Christ's love for us compels us, or that our love for him compels us. 
It's a trick question because it can actually mean either one. It's kind of a double entendre, if you would. So the question that I have before you is this. Does the love of Christ constrain you? Does the love of Christ control you or compel you? Does it draw you to take action, to do certain things? Now, I think if we're being honest, the best answer that any of us can possibly give is, yes, it constrains me or or controls me to a certain extent. Okay, we get it. What gets in the way of Christ's love compelling us, sin does. And we all sin, right? But friends, if the love of Christ is not compelling you to share the gospel, you have to repent. You have to repent. Learn to see yourself as a missionary. The only thing that will prevent the love of Christ from compelling you to share the gospel is sin. See, what we tend to do, just naturally, we all have a flesh nature. We all sin. And so what we tend to do, what the flesh inclines us to do is just withdraw from the world. We hate what we see, and and, and rightfully so. We should hate what we see in the world, especially in a culture like ours where we see that God's judgment is surely upon us. Yes, we, we should hate what we see. We know that the world hates us because the world hates Jesus. And so what ends up happening is we end up withdrawing and finding a community of people who are more like us to spend our time with. This is just called the the principle of homogeneity, which just means that we, we like being around people who like us and who are like us. But being a missionary necessarily entails having a willingness to do, to do things that you're uncomfortable with, to, to leave, to step outside of our comfort zones. When I went on a mission to Moldova in the summer of 2005, following my first year at seminary, man, I had no idea what I was in for, but I knew this. I knew that I was going to be put outside of my comfort zone. I, I just didn't care. I had no idea that we would be walking everywhere we went rather than taking a car. That was very uncomfortable. I had no idea that at one point I'd have to go nine days without taking a shower. And let me tell you, my fellow missionaries uh, hated that more than I did since I have no sense of smell. Uh, <laughs> I also had no idea that that's where I would first experience the calling to a preaching ministry. The guy who was in charge of the mission organization in Moldova told me on day one, you're the seminary guy, so you're going to do all the preaching. I hadn't even taken a preaching class yet. I had never preached anything in my entire life up to that point, and I had always hated public speaking. But it was there, way outside of my comfort zone, that I found a love for preaching that I found a calling for preaching. See, being a missionary means having a willingness to get outside of your comfort zone and knowing that that's just part of the way it works. It's good to have church family that you can gather regularly with, that you can speak to on a regular basis, that you can worship with on a regular basis, Uh, people with whom we share a common faith. Those should be our closest friendships. There are only a few things that are more important than gathering with the saints, especially on the Lord's Day, but we must avoid withdrawing from the culture around us entirely. So learn to find comfort. Learn to find contentment in trusting God outside of your comfort zone. Now, one objection that somebody somewhere might be thinking of is of how Lot moved to Sodom instead of staying in the promised land with Abraham as he should have. Uh, Two things. First of all, Lot was not sent by God into Sodom. That was completely on Lot. Lot was the one who decided to leave uh, Abraham and go into Sodom. Uh, It was entirely his decision, and he suffered greatly as a result of that decision, even though he himself was saved. But secondly, the point of the story isn't to stay away from the world. It's to be in the world, but not of it. And Lot not only became far too much like the world, which God rescued him from, by the way, but his wife... His wife was of the world. His wife loved the world so much that she was turned into a pillar of salt as a judgment against her. You're to be in the world, but not of it. 
What that means is that you are here in order that through your testimony, through your sharing of the gospel, through your lives, through your spoken words, you would serve as a means of people coming to believe in and know. Know in a saving sense. Believe in a saving sense. The Lord Jesus Christ. We are here in the world, but not of it, for the purpose of spreading the gospel into the world without having worldliness spread into us ourselves. And I understand how difficult this is. Our street preachers understand how difficult this is. I think many, you know, for, for, for many of us in our minds, there, there's not much difference between Sodom and Seattle. In fact, maybe, maybe Seattle's worse than Sodom was. I mean, I'm serious. Maybe it's worse. It's possible. I don't know. I didn't live in Sodom, thankfully. But there's no question that this area of the country, spiritually speaking, is a very, very dark place and that it is only getting darker. When we think that it can't get any darker, they prove us wrong every time. In some parts of our country, you can still go to church on Sunday and people won't think too much about it. But up here, if you go to church... And if you actually, you know, abide by what Scripture says, or if you actually believe that we're instructed to observe the Sabbath and keep it holy as the fourth commandment instructs, people here will immediately assume that there is something seriously wrong with you because humanity is supposed to be making progress, and that's an old road. So there must be something wrong with you if you think this book that's 2,000 plus years old applies to us today. That's how they view us. Nevertheless, we've been sent. We as individuals and as a church, we have been sent. We are here on a mission. And that mission may involve accepting the scorn and the rejection of man for the silliest things, the most common things. It might mean that your kids or your neighbors or your best friends from childhood want nothing to do with you in your old-fashioned religion in their minds. That might happen. Nevertheless, to whom do you belong? Amen. Who purchased you with his blood? Christ did. And so we have to press on faithfully. We must interact with non-Christians. We have to develop friendships with them, connections with them. Although I think it's worth noting that if a non-Christian is your closest friend, you are on thin ice, very thin ice. So please be very careful. It can either lead to a lot of pain or it can lead to a lot of compromise. Be careful, be wise, stay connected to uh, to a community of, of Christians that you can rely on. We can remain faithful by making sure that we continue to do things like avail ourselves to the means of grace, go to church, pray, study the Bible, things like that. We can, we can go to church. We can explain to people who think that we're just completely weird uh, that we do this or that because Scripture, which is our authority, instructs us in these ways. We should be doing that. They should be noticing that we're different and we should be explaining what our authority is. We should be inviting non-Christians to church. We should be inviting them to our midweek studies. We should be inviting them to come over to our places and to read and study the Bible with us and so on and so forth. The list just goes on and on. There are all kinds of ways to share the gospel with people, all sorts of opportunities that we should be talking to people about. All of this is to say that we should not only share the good news of Christ, but we must go into the world as he did. As he did. See, there, there's more than one parallel here. We saw the first one. Christ was sent into the world, and he sends us into the world. But the second one is found in verse 19. He was set apart. He was sanctified for the work, for the purposes of God. That is, he, he was not only uh, in accordance with, with Scripture, you know, holy in that sense, but he was set apart. Why? Look what he says in verse 19. He says, that they themselves may also be sanctified in truth. So in the words of James Montgomery Boyce, quote, the point here is that we are to be as Christ as we go into the world. He goes on to say, in other words, we are to be in our mission as Jesus was in his mission. We are to be like the one whom we are presenting. 
end quote. Now maybe this is part of our apprehension. Maybe this is part of why we, we want to withdraw from the culture instead of engaging, because we realize that we're hypocrites. We're hypocrites. We, we, we preach the gospel, yes. Uh, every single one of us, though, we, we, while we, we have a standard that we point to in Scripture, we recognize that we don't live up to it. We're hypocrites. And that makes it very difficult for us to find comfort presenting the gospel while we know that we ourselves fall short. We know that we're called to be sanctified, and yet we remain sinners. Uh, James Boyce tells a story of a woman who developed a new weight loss program called Weight Right before Weight Watchers became a thing. And this woman just couldn't get anyone to invest in or to, to buy her product. And so finally, she asked her, her husband, why he thought her, uh, her product wasn't breaking through. So he checked out the packaging that she had and thought that it looked really good, that there was a lot of appeal to it. Uh, so he asked her to give him her sales pitch. And when she did, you know, he thought that was, that was fine as well. It was great. It was enthusiastic. It was filled with good information and statistics. Finally, he asked to see the brochures. And while he did, he said, oh, and when asked why he said, oh, that way, he responded by asking, shall I be polite or truthful? Husbands, this is where you run, by the way. <laughs> she said, truthful. And so he said, well, dear, you look like the picture before, not the picture after. Now, husbands, <laughs> this is not a lesson in how to speak to your wives or how to love your wives. Remember that the fish that doesn't open his mouth doesn't get snared by the hook, right? <laughs> but no, the point is that for many Christians, we know that we aren't yet as we should be yeah. or as we will be. And yet we're presenting Christ and the gospel to people who need it knowing that we ourselves fall short of it. But the way to resolve this is not to stop evangelizing. The way to, to resolve this isn't to stop sharing the gospel or to shy away from people. The way to resolve this is to stop putting ourselves on display and to instead put Christ on display, openly confessing that we fall short of his perfection, yet nevertheless we are pressing on to know him and to grow in his likeness. You can be a hypocrite in front of people if you're willing to be honest about it. Yeah. You're not the one on display. You're not the one that you're pointing people to. Jesus is. Right. Jesus is. We are to be like Christ in every way, of course. That's the goal. Even if the bar is set impossibly high, the scriptures nevertheless do instruct us to strive for holiness without which no one will see God, and to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. But we should see that there's special attention in this passage in John, given to the characteristics that Jesus has laid out over the past several verses. As he prayed that his disciples would know his joy that they would be holy, that is, that they would be sanctified, that they would be a people who live their lives in accordance with the truths revealed in Scripture. These things all should be present in our mission. Because if you go into the world without Christ's joy, remember that joy is just having the, the quiet uh, confidence and contentment that God is using every circumstance of your life to work out his purposes, even painful circumstances. That's why Christ, when he was on the cross, he still had joy because he had this quiet confidence that God was in charge, that nothing was happening that wasn't outside of God's, uh, that was outside of the sphere of God's sovereignty. So if you go into the world without Christ's joy, then yes, the scorn the mockery, the animosity that you'll receive will dissuade you from ever trying that again. But if you share the gospel faithfully, knowing that God is in charge, knowing that his word never returns to him void, you can have that quiet confidence too as you share the gospel. If you know that as you preach, if you know that Christ is pleased and that, God's, that God is sovereign over everything, 
then you can be confident that he will use the sharing, he will use the preaching of his gospel to call his sheep, and that his word never fails. And, and at that point, then the scorn and the mockery and the animosity, the hatred that you'll receive from the world won't dissuade you because you'll experience Christ's joy in doing that. The gospel is good news. And if it's good news, friends, we should have joy about it. We should have joy about it. After all, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you go into the world without being sanctified, without a, a degree of holiness, you're just going to blend in with the world. What good are you going to be? What good is salt when it's lost its flavor? It's not. It's not any good. There will be nothing different about you. How important is holiness? Well, it's what Jesus is emphasizing actually the most here when he said, for their sakes I sanctify myself that they may themselves be sanctified in truth. Jesus was sanctified for the work that the Father had given him to accomplish. When he ate with sinners, all the Pharisees could accuse him of was eating with sinners. They couldn't even accuse him of a sin, engaging of a sin, in a sin, or endorsing their sin, just eating with them. And if we're to be like Christ in this sense, in the world but not of it, we must interact with sinners. And we must do so with a degree of personal sanctification, personal holiness, separate from the world, but not separated from the world. Spreading the gospel into the world without allowing worldliness to spread into us. And if you go into the world without the truth of the scriptures, again, you're just going to blend in. What, what, what are you going to be able to accomplish if you don't have the truth of the Scriptures? Without the truth, all you have is man's fallen wisdom. All you have is a lie. We all know that the truth of the gospel will offend natural man. And yet, Scripture explicitly instructs us that we are to go into the world and that we are to speak truth, although we are to do it in love. This past week, I, uh, I drove down to visit a, a pastor friend of mine down south. And as I was coming back up through Seattle, I saw a large banner on the side of a church building just north of Seattle that says, Jesus loves Seattle. Now, I had a few thoughts about that that I thought were relevant to this text. First of all, it's true, at least in, in one sense. After all, Jesus hasn't uh, brought down fire from heaven on Seattle. He hasn't unleashed his wrath completely on Seattle. He instead allows Seattle to indulge in all of her godlessness, all of her hostility toward things that are good and, and, and holy and pure. But that isn't driven by his love. That is the type of judgment that we see in Romans 1, where God hands sinners over to their sin so that they are just consumed by it, which is exactly what we see in Seattle. My second thought was that I couldn't imagine someone hanging a large banner in Sodom which read, Jesus loves Sodom. The first century church would never, ever have put up a sign that says, Jesus loves Sodom. Rome. Uh, both of those would have been entirely both inappropriate and ineffective means of reaching out to those cities who would have just thought to themselves, as the majority of Seattle does as they uh, drive by this sign, oh, Jesus loves Seattle. That, that's good because I, I love Seattle too. I, I, love, I love me too. Third, a banner that says Jesus loves Seattle isn't speaking the truth. And so it certainly isn't speaking the truth in love. Just like going up to someone and saying, Jesus loves you, isn't speaking the truth in love unless they're a Christian. It, Jesus loves you isn't the gospel. And the last thing that we want to do is give people a sense that they're okay with God right where they are by telling them that. The last thing we want to do is tell people who are on the broad road that leads to destruction that they're good right where they are. 
that Jesus loves them, when the loving thing to do would be to tell them that they are on the broad road that leads to destruction. And best case scenario, they will be among those who hear from Jesus on the last day, away from me, depart from me, I never knew you. When we should be saying, when we should be giving them the message that all who repent and all who believe in Jesus, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what they need to hear. Now, what we can say with confidence is that Jesus isn't done with Seattle. Praise the Lord. Jesus is not done with Seattle. That is 100% true. Our street preachers go down to Seattle. That's proof. He's not done with Seattle. He has us, and he has some other faithful churches here, and he's still using the preaching of the gospel, whether that's in churches or on street corners, to call people in Seattle out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And his word will not return void to him. So, Jesus isn't done with Seattle. Therefore, press on in our mission. There are two additional characteristics that I think are at least implied here and that will be helpful for us as we act as missionaries to the world. The first is agape love. Uh, Jesus came into the world because of love. Uh, to love in, in this sense means to desire the greatest good for another. But let's remember that love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. That's what the world does. It's what the world wants us to do. When people see that sign, that's what they think Jesus is doing of the sins that you see going on parade down in Seattle. But real biblical love does not rejoice with unrighteousness. Instead, love rejoices with the truth. God's word, not the culture. God's word tells us what is true. Paul defines this word love for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 7, where he writes, love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. In other words, you can't be like these things when you're on a mission. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take account of wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. In a nutshell, there's agape love for you. Without this kind of love for the lost, what are we going to sound like to them? Paul actually tells us in verse 1 of chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, he says, we'll sound like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal if you go as a missionary without love. And the final characteristic that I think is implied or, or that's useful for us as we go into the world, if we're to go as Christ went into the world, is compassion. Don't hate the people who are slaves to sin. Feel compassion for them. Matthew tells us that when Jesus looked upon the masses of people who had come to have him minister to them, he says in Matthew 9, 36, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Friends, if you go into the world without joy, holiness, truth, a sense of mission, agape love, and compassion, then the world's scorn very well could cause you to become jaded. But if we go out into the world with these things, the world will notice. We will be completely different from the world, and they will notice. The Lord Jesus is building his church just as he promised, and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. The picture there is not of the world trying to get in, or the, of, of hell trying to get into the church, but of church going into the world to rescue sinners by preaching the gospel. And the means of salvation, the means that God has ordained to this end is sending his people into the world with the only message, the only truly good news of redemption and reconciliation with God by grace alone through faith alone, in Christ alone. We are here in the world, but we're not to be of it for the purpose of spreading the gospel into the world without having worldliness spread into us ourselves. May God fill us, therefore, with joy 
with holiness, with truth, with love, and with compassion as we go. And may he grant us the grace and personal conviction to devote ourselves to this cause, to this mission, to faithfully following it above every other calling in life for the glory of Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we we thank you even for the times when your word confronts us, when your word convicts us, when your word instructs us to do things that we are prone not to do, to do things that we're uncomfortable doing. Thank you for the assurance that we never go without you. Thank you for the assurance that you are with us until the end. And thank you for the assurance that your word never returns void to you. And in light of these truths, O Lord, give us boldness. Give us courage. Give us conviction. Give us joy and holiness, a love for truth, love for the lost, and compassion for the lost, that we may be faithful to this mission in order that Christ would be glorified through the preaching of the gospel. We pray that many, O Lord, in our area would hear the good shepherd calling out to them, calling them out of darkness into light through the preaching of the gospel. Here we are, Lord. Send us. Use us. May our preaching of the gospel glorify Christ and call the sheep to him. In his name we pray. Amen.